Welcome along fellow time travelers. This is Scott Cardinal. In this micro lesson we're going to travel to West Hollywood to check out the Viper Room. The reason for a micro lesson such as this is to celebrate the homes, gardens, and workspaces of creative people throughout history. And it's also to help people understand what the architectural and design elements are when they look at buildings. Also, studying architecture and design can help people increase their powers of observation that could be used in other areas of their lives. So, let's get rolling! The Viper Room is a nightclub and live music venue that's located on the Sunset Strip in West Hollywood. It was established as the Viper Room in 1993 and was partly owned by actor Johnny Depp. Another owner was Sal Junko. He starred as Blowfish in 21 Jump Street with Johnny Depp. The two were childhood friends when they lived in Florida. There was also at least one other owner that I know of. He was a gentleman named Anthony Fox, and he had a 49% stake in the Viper Room. And I'll talk more about him later. Now, as far as the history of the location, built back in 1921, it's one of the oldest buildings on the Sunset Strip. At that time, the space was the location of a small grocery store. In 1946, the space was converted into a nightclub called the Cotton Club, which, by the way, was entirely unrelated to the one in New York City's Harlem. A year later, in May of 1947, the Cotton Club was replaced by the Greenwich Village Inn, where such jazz musicians as Phil Moore would perform. What is this? Hey! You sinners, you better get up and repent. Tell me who threw the whiskey in the well. Two and a half years later, at the end of 1949, the space became a cafe named the Rue Angel. And on January 9th of 1950, a fire broke out in the rear of the building, which caused $10,000 in damages, which is roughly 100000 bucks today. But the fire damage was quickly repaired, and by September of 1950, the space was repurposed once again, this time as a strip joint. And it was known as the Last Call. It offered something called Strip Capades which was five hours of continuous entertainment, seven nights a week. But that didn't last too long, and so from 1951 until 1969, the location became a bar called The Melody Room. And The Melody Room was known for its very diverse lineup of performers. For example, Bobby Short, one of the premier cabaret singers of the era, performed in residence there in the late 1960s. Story is much too sad to be told. Oh, practically everything leaves me totally cold. The Melody Room was also known as a hangout for gangsters. And so in the early days, you could see Ben Siegel and Mickey Cohen hanging out and watching live jazz. In 1969, the space became a rock music club called Filthy McNasties. The club was a really popular hangout for Tom Waits and Phyllis Diller. John Wayne would go there. So would Little Richard and Mick Jagger. Elvis Presley used to go there. So did Monty Rock III. Well, I've been looking for my baby. Every day, every night. Have you seen my baby? and even Evil Knievel. <laughs> All of whom appreciated McNasty's ban on photographers. And in 1974, the cover photo for Sweet's album, Desolation Boulevard, was taken on the Sunset Strip, and it showed filthy McNasties in the background. In the 1980s, the space became a club called The Central. Ricky Lee Jones and John Belushi used to hang out there. And the club featured Chuck E. Weiss and the Goddamn Liars every Monday night for 11 years. And in those early days, the Go-Go's filmed the music video for their song, Our Lips Are Sealed, right there in the club. 
In the 1983 film Valley Girl, the building was used for scenes featuring the new wave band, the Plimsolls. And in Oliver Stone's 1991 film, The Doors, the building was used as a filming location for scenes that depicted the London Fog. That was a nightclub in West Hollywood where The Doors had their first regular gigs in early 1966. When it was announced that The Central was going to be shutting down, musician Chuck E. Weiss suggested to Johnny Depp that he should open up a club there. In fact, it was Mr. Weiss who came up with the name The Viper Room. It's also been said that Tom Waits played a role in encouraging Johnny Depp to open the club. The idea of the club was to have a music venue where celebrities like Johnny Depp could hang out and not have to worry about being bothered by paparazzi. And that's when a gentleman named Anthony Fox got involved. And I assume he's the one who put up all the money because he owned 49% of the Viper Room. Johnny Depp and his friend Sal Jenko, and quite possibly others that we don't know about, divided up the remaining 51%. Anthony Fox was a British citizen and he held a UK passport. He came from a very wealthy British family with links to royalty. But legend has it that he was involved with a lot of seedy and shady people. The grand opening of the Viper Room was on August 14th of 1993, with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers performing. The Viper Room then went on to host rock and metal and punk rock bands. Sadly, on the night before Halloween of 1993, actor River Phoenix overdosed on drugs inside the club. He was brought outside where he collapsed and was having seizures. He was quickly brought to the hospital where he was pronounced dead from heart failure, brought on by an overdose of cocaine and heroin. He was only 23 years old. Johnny Depp was very upset about this, as was the entire Hollywood community and fans of River Phoenix all around the world. Fans brought flowers and candles and other items and they placed them in front of the Viper Room. And fans covered the club doors with graffiti. The Viper Room closed down for a while, but it reopened two weeks later. And out of respect for River's tragic death, every year the club was closed on Halloween night. In late 1994 and early 1995, Adam Duritz, who was the lead singer of The Counting Crows, worked as a bartender in the Viper Room. Word has it that he was trying to keep himself grounded after experiencing all that newfound fame. In 1994, Johnny Cash performed at the venue. He debuted material that would later appear on American Recordings, which was his 81st album. The songs he performed at the Viper Room were Tennessee Stud and The Man Who Couldn't Cry. In early 1995, Australian singer and actor Jason Donovan suffered a drug-induced seizure at the club, and thankfully he survived. And then come the Pussycat Dolls. They performed at the Viper Room at least once a week from 1995 all the way until 2001. In November of 1997, it was at the Viper Room where Australian rock star Michael Hutchins played his last public performance. That was a week before his suicide. Now, I'm probably going to pronounce this next guy's name incorrectly, but I'll give it my best try. In 1997, a gentleman named John Frusciante, who was the guitarist with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, performed a few solo live performances at the Viper Room. This was about four years after Johnny Depp produced a documentary called Stuff that showed the squalor in which John was living. In 2001, the co-owner of the Viper Room, Anthony Fox, was scheduled to testify in court after bringing a lawsuit against five people, including Johnny Depp. Fox had accused Johnny Depp of defrauding him of millions of dollars in profits, and he was due to testify against his business partners. Fox was last seen in Ventura County, California on December 19th of 2001. He disappeared along with his pickup truck and a 38 caliber revolver. A few weeks later, on January 6th of 2002, his truck was found abandoned in Santa Clara, California. He left behind several thousands of dollars in a bank account that remained untouched. He also left a teenage daughter named Constance. Rumors abounded that Johnny Depp had a hand in the disappearance, and some even speculated that Fox had been murdered and buried in the basement of the Viper Room. But as mentioned previously, Mr. Fox supposedly interacted with some pretty rough characters, and there was also some evidence that he may have disappeared and went to live off-grid. As of the date of this recording, there are no news reports about what happened to Anthony Fox. In 2003, a scene from Charlie's Angels was filmed at the club. In 2004, as part of the settlement of a lawsuit involving the disappearance of Anthony Fox, Johnny Depp relinquished his partial ownership of the Viper Room, and he gave it to Mr. Fox's daughter, Constance, and she turned around and resold it. Since then, the club has changed multiple times, and it's currently owned by Viper Room Holdings. As of the date of this recording, there are plans to tear down the building where the Viper Room is and put up a new structure. 
the original plan was to build a new mixed-use development, including housing and retail and dining, a music venue, and a luxury hotel. The 15-story structure was to feature what had been described as being a plant-adorned vertical tower with a crescent-shaped tower that join at the top and the bottom. It would have contained 115 hotel rooms, 31 market rate residential units, and 10 affordable housing units. At the street level, there were plans to build a two-story podium with cafes, public spaces, and retail spaces. And there were also plans to re-envision the Viper Room, including adding a recording studio and updating the live music experience. The condo and hotel would have been separated by a 100-foot wide gap, which would have helped it avoid a conventional large flat building facade. And there were plans for a rooftop garden and terrace for an outdoor dining and social space for the neighborhood. But over the course of time, those plans were scrapped for newer ones. But the mixed use remains the same. So, as of the time of this recording, the plan is to build West Hollywood's first five-star boutique hotel, along with affordable and market-rate homes, conference and event spaces, and a reimagined Viper Room. Highlights of that will include a distinctly gray-colored walkway, which plays upon the venue's original distinctive color scheme that showcases the venue's Sunset Boulevard street-level entrance. There will also be modern soundproofing to keep the music inside and not out into the neighborhood. And memorabilia from the original Viper Room will be featured throughout the venue. There's also going to be a larger stage, superior acoustics, and stellar sound equipment in order to create a better music experience for performers and concert goers. And there will be a cutting-edge recording studio. And so this concludes this micro-lesson about the Viper Room in West Hall. If you have any thoughts about this subject matter, please put those in the comments below and share what's on your mind. If you enjoy this video, please share it, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to my channel. Until next time, I wish you safe travels and all your journeys.